Hey, poker people, it's Sky Matsuhashi, and this is the Smart Poker Study Podcast. In episode 156, I discuss the power of asking great questions in hand reading and within the rest of your poker studies. It's poker study time, y'all. Thank you so very much for spreading the word uh, about the podcast. And and right now, a big thank you to all who've downloaded and left reviews on the Volume 2 ebook. I really do appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't picked up your own copy yet, you can get the ebook for only $2.99 for a short time on Amazon uh, before it increases to $4.99. And the paperback is also available right now. And I am in the process of getting the audiobook approved by Audible, so probably a few more days for that. These are exciting times. I can't wait for all three versions to be up and running on Amazon and across all the different countries too. So if it's not available in your country just yet, in your country's Amazon just yet, uh, it will be be soon so be on the lookout and so this second book launch is going really well uh if you pick it up please leave a review as that helps to spread the word and i want honest reviews of course but i really do love those five star reviews uh and i will read a couple of them later on in the podcast here and uh speaking of of just the book launch going really well we actually broke the top 400 in the kindle uh ebook ebook category i guess and then so thank you very much to everybody on the launch team and who've purchased it up until now and left reviews i really do appreciate it let's keep it going y'all so we can get even higher on the kindle lists and so um well it is about that time to do the podcast we've got a q a going on today three questions with three answers and if you want these q a's to keep on keeping on uh just send me those questions i love answering them and please visit the show notes page for everything i discussed today along with screenshots and the links and you can get all of that at smartpokerstudy.com slash pod 157. Alrighty, let's do this. Gambate. And now for our feature presentation. So today's first question comes to us from Han Trin. And Han says, the issue is post-flop value bet sizing against different board textures. When to slow play or to fast play and when to be cautious or not. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for that, Han. I do appreciate it here. When it comes to uh, uh, post-flop value bet sizing, you really want to size it based on what you think your opponent is willing to pay. The fishier uh, the opponent, you know, the more stationary they are, the more or the greater the bet sizing they'll call. And the harder they hit the flop, the more they're willing to pay as well. You know, somebody who hit just top pair is probably going to pay a bit less than somebody who flopped a set, for example, if if you uh, if you're betting your straight or your full house. And I think bet sizing is part skill and art, and it takes a feel for the player that you're up against, the the situation that you're in, and also their pre-flop range and their board interaction at the time. And in order to get better at this, in order to get better at the the post-flop value bet sizing, I recommend doing hand history reviews when you look at value betting hands. So run some kind of a filter for flopping top pair or better hands. You know, you can run filters for flopping or even turning or rivering uh, straights, flushes, trips, two pair kind of hands. And look at those hands with an eye towards getting value out of your opponent. And you need to gauge whether or not you did bet to get the max value. And not only look at your actual value bet sizing at the time, but consider, hey, if I would have made this value bet just two big blinds more or three big blinds or 10 big blinds, or or if I would have doubled this bet, would they still have paid me off? The more thinking that you do in regards to value betting and the more um, analyzing you do in your actual value betting hands, this kind of work will translate to your on the felt play and will hopefully lead to you getting more value. And I do recommend doing more than just reviewing hands. I want you to do full-on hand reading exercises where you assign a pre-flop range and narrow it through the streets, just like I'm doing in my 66 days of hand reading videos, uh, which you can see currently on Twitch or on YouTube. And this really is the kind of thing that takes a lot of hard work, a lot of time, but it's going to go the furthest into improving your game. Not only your post-flop value betting skills, but your post-flop bluffing and your understanding of opponents and your exploiting of opponents, all that stuff. Hand reading really builds those skills. And by analyzing what your opponents are calling your bets with, you'll begin to gain a greater understanding of just what they're willing to call in general. And you mentioned some other things in your in your email here, Han, and I wouldn't adjust my bet sizes based on board textures. You want to base it more on your opponent's range and what you think they're willing to call. So 
if they do have a top pair hand on a three flush board, sure, maybe they're maybe they are uh, not willing to call as much. Maybe they'll call half pots or less. But on a on a on a rainbow board, maybe they'll call full pot size better, three quarter pots. That's a possibility. But that is based on your opponent's range and what you think they are capable of playing. You know, some stationy fishy players will call a full pot size bet no matter what with top pair on any kind of board on the flop, while other ones will just fold straight away top pair hands on that three flush board. So you just need to really base it on the opponent and the situation you're in. And you also had mentioned slow playing or flat, fast playing. And that also depends on your opponent and what you think they have. Against those fishy players, you want to fast play, just bet, 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 bet as much as you can. And against someone who likely won't pay you off, or they obviously missed the flop, you want to slow play to lull them into thinking that you don't have a hand, or just give them the opportunity to bluff against you and get value that way. And you would also mention about playing cautiously. And when it comes to cautious play, that's really something we should always be doing. When your opponents are calling every street, ask yourself, what are they calling with right here? When they suddenly raise your bet, ask yourself, hey, what hands do they do this? What hands do they bet with like this? What hands do they raise with like this? Never just think that you can bet, 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 or call, call, call without a care about your hand. Don't do that kind of stuff willy-nilly. Their actions are trying to tell you something. So always play cautiously and have a clear, logical reason for your decision. And once again, thank you very much, Han, for that question. I do appreciate it. On to question number two. This one is about working to increase aggression. And it comes from Camillo, Colorado right here. And uh, uh, what Camillo says is, the one poker skill I need to improve right now is aggression. Right now, I play a fit or fold strategy. Very ABC poker. Alrighty, well, thank you very much for that email, Camillo. I appreciate it, of course. And I'm sure the listening audience appreciates it as well. Um, and I, for the longest time, I was, and I'm still kind of in the same boat as you. I've increased my aggression gradually over time, pre-flop and post-flop. But there's still more that I want to do, obviously. And it's good to be more aggressive so you aren't as predictable. If you can be raising with your flush draws, your straight draws, your gut shots, your top pairs, your second pairs, your sets. If you can be raising and betting with all those different kind of hands, it does make you a little bit less predictable by your opponents. And when you are utilizing aggression, you're not playing that passive and foldy kind of poker. You know, you're sticking it to your opponents, making them make the decisions. And that's pretty good. And I've done a few things to really work out of my tight aggressive nature. Number one is I've created uh, pre-flop ranges, not only open ranges, of course, but cold calling and three betting by position ranges. If you do this, you'll have done a lot of your thinking and your aggressive strategy work off the tables. And it will help you to keep your aggression up when you're actually in game when you refer to those ranges right here. The second thing I've done and I want you to do is plan your c-bet and your post-flop raising strategies. So choose the types of hands you'll start raising or betting more often with. If you find yourself playing every draw passively, then pick and choose some hands. Maybe choose nut flush draws and second nut flush draws and open enders to start doing some raising, some check raising, or you're betting with those hands when you get checked to. If you play every second pair and non-pair hand passively, Choose some to practice getting aggressive with, right? If your opponent is possibly c-bet bluffing with every ace in their range, and if you don't have an ace, go ahead and throw out that bluff check raise or that bluff raise to get them to fold their ace high hands. And also try different sizings of bets and raises to see what's effective as well. And you can get more aggressive for your value hands as well. So go for more value with your top pair hands, top pair decent kicker type hands, or better than that, when you believe that your hand is ahead of a good portion of the opponent's range. The third thing that I do to kind of get myself to be more aggressive is I have a specific goal each session before I play. So maybe it's kind of a, a pre-flop goal. Maybe my goal is to steal more often. Then I would really pay attention to those in the blinds and their style of play along with their stats to get me to steal more often. Or maybe your goal is kind of a post-flop related aggression goal and it's to raise some C bets as bluffs. So having this aggressive goal will keep your mind focused on being aggressive and will lead to you just basically being more aggressive. And the fourth way that I've upped my aggression or practiced upping my aggression in the past is I drop down in stakes. And this is normally for online play, you know. It's tough to drop down lower than 1-2 live if you're a 1-2 live player. But online, you can go as low as you need to, even down to 2NL, 2-cent games, you know. Um, 
what I often do is I'll drop down to 5NL or 10NL and kind of practice some three betting, practice some post-flop aggressive strategies right here. Now, your opponents might not react at those lower levels like they would at the higher levels that you normally play at. But the thing is, what you're doing here is just practicing getting aggressive, trying to get comfortable with utilizing that aggression, picking specific spots. Like I said earlier, you're going to start raising every one of your nut flush draws, every one of your second flush draws. Maybe you want to practice raising every one of your gut shots. Maybe you're raising every one of your third pairs. Whatever it is, just get in there and start practicing it. And by dropping down in stakes, it makes any mistakes that you make less costly. Uh, so, so go ahead. Those are my four recommendations right there. So thank you very much for that question, Camillo. I am so excited. Volume two of How to Study Poker is finally available on Amazon. Um, it's about a month later than I had intended it to. Just the whole editing process, it just an audiobook process took a lot longer than I thought it would. So I was delayed a bit, but it is up and running now. I'm not sure if it's available in every country just yet, but it will be soon. So just do an Amazon search for how to study poker and you will find it. And I have a couple different, I have a lot of reviews actually, but I want to read two different reviews to you today. One is from Ken Nielsen and the other one is from Amazon user 51. So I guess it's kind of an anonymous review. Let me read those for you. So this first one is from Ken Nielsen, and it's actually a long one. I'm not going to read the full thing, but I will read the first and, and last paragraphs of it. If you were like me several months ago, you would buy the newest poker book out there and finish it in a week or two and add a few new things to your game and go on to the next book. Not anymore after reading Sky's first book, How to Study Poker Volume 1. I have used the techniques to work on my game in a new and better way, and I am blown away by how much I am learning. Sky's second book is another winner you must buy if you are serious about improving your poker game. This book is the continuation on the best way to study poker. Sweet. And then the last paragraph goes, Sky, you have written another game changer in how to study poker. I'll be going through this book multiple times, just like in volume one. Well, thank you very much for that, Ken. I do appreciate that review. That's awesome. I love it. Um, and then so uh, let's see here. The second one was that anonymous review by um, Amazon Reader goes on to say, this the first book was so good, I bought the second one as well. Learning how to study poker has always been hard for me. These two books by Sky have been a great help for my game. This volume gives daily ways to study and apply what you learn in uh, in your game. Love it and appreciate how everything is thoroughly spelled out. I have to admit that I don't understand everything in the book because I'm a newbie, but am learning. Great set of books. Alrighty, thank you very much, Amazon Reader 51 and Ken Nielsen, for those lovely reviews. All right, and I have a few shout outs right here. First up is everybody on the launch team who actually purchased the pre-sale PDF. We had over 70 purchasers, so that was awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. I do appreciate it. On the last podcast, I read like 35 names or so, and I'll do it again all in one breath. Here it goes. Johnny, Jim, Han, Mark, Ahotlar, Boyd 148, Gerard, Faith, Klaus, Garrett, Stanley, Darren, John, Robert, Kat, Alan, Brock, Zeljko, Alex, Ryan, Kimberly, Pete, Brian, Ray, Chim, Oliver, Jason, Paul, Randy, Robert, Andrew, Steve, LB, Dave, Ajit, Kevin, Brennan, Shane, Tom, Roland, Roman, Mike, Tom, Nadal. <gasps> Got them all. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I really do appreciate all that support um, uh, for the, for buying that pre-sale PDF. You have helped to push this book up the Amazon charts. I do appreciate it, everybody. And also a few more quick shout outs. John Walsh decided to buy the Smart HUD. Thank you very much, John. He is improving his game with Poker Tracker 4, and I'm glad to be of service to you, John. And then we have um, uh, three different people who purchased webinars. Han Tran, who was question number one. Uh, Han purchased the How to Study Poker webinar. Thank you very much, Han. Good luck with those studies. And then Jason Bullock purchased the Opponent Destruction webinar. He is taking this, he is learning, and then he is going and destroying those opponents. Good luck to you, Jason. And then Kevin Bouchard is a webinar, uh, is a webinar lover, I guess. He went and purchased Poker Tracker 4 webinar, How to Study Poker webinar, and Mashing the Micros webinar. Kevin is intent on improving his game. So thank you very much, Kevin, Jason, and Han, for purchasing those webinars. And if anybody would like links to those same webinars, just go to the show notes page for today, find links so you can get them for yourself, and learn from webinars. Alrighty, poker people, back to class. 
So the final question today is about total implied odds, and it comes from Shane. Now, the email was pretty detailed with lots of examples and stuff, but I'm just going to give my thoughts on the whole idea of total implied odds that Shane discusses right here with some examples and stuff. So Shane in the email said, how do I work out the total implied odds over all three streets based on knowledge of villains bet sizing and other relevant factors? All right. Thank you very much for that question, Shane. And just to be honest with everybody, I've never heard the term total implied odds before. And the idea of calculating implied odds on all streets according to a villain's bet sizing. What I took from this question was that Shane was asking about if the villain bet, for example, or if I was betting, for example, two-thirds pot on every street, how do I calculate what the river pot size will be? Um, or if I bet one-third pot, or if the opponent bets half pot and I raise 2.5x, what? how do I calculate it? Well, just to answer what the bet sizings could be street by street and the uh, river and the, and the final river pot size. Well, the way to calculate that is basically use an Excel spreadsheet. You know, start with a dollar pot, for example, and then calculate on different lines. You know, a two-thirds pot would be this, and then a call would add this to the pot. So now the turn pot would be this. I mean, you can use Excel and just run the math for different bet sizings and raise sizings to figure that kind of stuff out. But really, I'll be honest with you, I don't use total implied odds, and it's something I've never, never learned about. Um, I only think about implied odds in two different scenarios right here. Scenario number one is I'm considering calling with a speculative hand preflop. So like I have small to mid pocket pairs for set mining. I have suited connectors or suited aces for some kind of flush or straight potential. You know, I use implied odds to determine if those potentially strong hands are worth playing preflop. And this is where I will use the 20x rule that I've discussed before. So if the bet that I'm facing is 75 cents, for example, there has to be at least 20 times that in the stacks behind so at least $15 in the stacks behind if there is that and it looks like a good opportunity to play these speculative hands then I'll make the call I don't think about he's betting 75 now if I call the pot will be a dollar 65 or uh what $75 50 a dollar, a dollar eighty-five on the pot if the two blinds fold. Now, if he bets a dollar and I call a dollar, now it'll be three eighty-five on the turn. I don't think about stuff like that. I simply use at the time the twenty x rule um, to determine whether or not the implied odds are there. And when it comes to post flop. I consider what I can possibly win if I chase my draw. And the other night, I folded a nine high flush draw because the opponent had only $4 in his stack with a $1.35 pot on the flop. I can't remember what happened. I think the opponent might have bet 75 cents or a full dollar, but I could have chased it at the time. But really, after his dollar bet, if I would have just called, he only has $3 back in his stack. There really wasn't enough behind to make it worth the chase. It's not like I had a pair plus the flush draw. I think I just had just the nine high. It might have been like an ace, queen, deuce kind of board, you know. Nine high, no draw other than the flush draw. And so with no implied odds, just really wasn't worth chasing it. And just to explain a little bit about implied odds, the implied odds are just the stack that's behind divided by the amount you have to put into the pot. So if on the flop, you know, you both started with $100 stacks and $3 put in pre-flop. Now you have $97 stacks. If he decides to bet $6 right here, well, when you take away 6 from the 97, you're left with a $91 stack behind, right? So 91 divided by that 6 means there's 15x behind to possibly win. So you are you could possibly win 15 times the current bet that you're facing. So when I'm considering whether or not to draw, it really is a combination of the pot odds I'm being offered right now versus how likely I am to hit my draw. I use the stack behind to sway me one way or the other on close decisions. So let's say I had a flush draw for about 18% chance to hit. If my opponent bets half pot, I technically need or mathematically need 25% equity to make a break-even call. I only have 18% equity, so it's a bad, mathematically bad call, and I should fold. But if he started the hand with a full stack and there's tons of potential money to make, I might choose to call, especially if he's sticky, like if he's betting right now with a top pair hand, but I hit my flush, he won't be folding, I could still choose to call. And there might be other reasons to call, like I'm in position, he might be uh, turn honest on the next street, so he might check and fold a lot. Maybe he's a one and done player, and I just know that this is the only bet I'm facing unless he has the nut. So I might just call in order to see a cheap turn, but then a free river because he's checking most turns. 
And also, of course, maybe I have the nut flush draw with two overs. Maybe I have like uh, the ace ten of spades on a on a you know on a on a on a, a four three seven board with two spades. So I have I can hit an ace for a top pair, a ten for a top pair, um, or a spade for the flush. So that might convince me to call as well. Alrighty, thank you very much for that question, Shane. I do appreciate it. Challenge. Here's my challenge to you for this episode. Start increasing your aggression in logical ways. Choose your 3-bet and 4-bet ranges ahead of time, and practice making the 3-bets and the 4-bets. Don't do it willy-nilly, though. If you're 3-betting for value, or if you're bluff C-betting, or if you are a uh, uh, value double-barreling, know that your opponent can continue with worse hands if you're going for value, and know that they can fold if you are trying to make the bluff. Being a more aggressive player requires you to be more comfortable with aggression, and that only comes with practicing that aggression. Now it's your turn to take action and do something positive for your poker game. Now get it on. This episode isn't complete until you head to the show notes page at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod157. Thank you very much for listening today. If you can type or say the word Smart Poker Study, you can find me on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and now on Anchor. You can also hear the show on your Amazon Echo device. Just tell it to play the Smart Poker Study podcast on TuneIn. And of course, along with these Q&As, if you have a Q&A, or not a Q&A, if you have a question of your own, send it in to sky at smartpokerstudy.com. And then please check out my book on Amazon whatever country you're in, Amazon, uh, just type in how to study poker and then bam, volumes one and two will pop up and volume two right now is on sale for a little bit of a discount. Alrighty, next week in episode 158, I will conclude the hand reading MED with class number five when I discuss learning from showdowns. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so thank you very much for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring is what helps us grow. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet. I wanna lie, I want the world.